Think of the biggest college rivalry in your state. The students, alumni, and fans of both schools have a strong loyalty to their university. Small differences and petty details can lead to an intense dislike of the rival school and everyone associated with it. Before the Civil War, northern states and southern states developed an intense rivalry similar to a college rivalry. Disagreements about slavery and government, as well as differences in economics and culture, led to an intense mutual dislike between the regions. This led to an era of sectionalism in America. Sectionalism is defined as an intense and exaggerated loyalty to a particular region of the country. Northern states favored limits on slavery and opposed the spread of slavery into Western territories. They also generally supported the sovereignty of the federal government over states' rights in most cases. Southern states resented outside interference in Southern affairs and strongly supported the spread of slavery into new Western territories. They advocated for the sovereignty of states to determine their own affairs, completely free from interference by the federal government. Sectionalism entrenched both sides and led them to stubbornly resist defeat in any debate it had with the other. This set the stage for intense conflict over issues like slavery, state sovereignty, and economics. One of the early tests in the era of sectionalism was nullification. Nullification means to legally overturn or strike down a law. Southerners strongly believed in the sovereign right of the states to nullify any federal law that they considered unconstitutional. Southerners cited the Tenth Amendment, which set a strict limit on the power of the federal government over states. Southerners felt that the federal government had been formed by a contract between the states that granted only certain powers to the federal government. As signers of the contract, the states gave the federal government permission to only use the powers expressly granted to it in the Constitution. If the federal government passed a law that went beyond their expressed powers, Southerners felt that the states had the right to nullify the law. Both Northern and Southern states attempted to use the principle of nullification during the early years of the Republic. Southerners drafted the Virginia and Kentucky Resolutions in 1788 and 1789 in order to nullify the Alien and Sedition Acts passed during the administration of John Adams. These two acts infringed on a citizen's freedom of speech and prohibited them from speaking out against the government while the government attempted to negotiate peace with France. Because these two acts infringed on the First Amendment right to freedom of speech, the Virginia and Kentucky state legislatures decided to strike down the laws as unconstitutional and refused to obey them. During the War of 1812, Northern Federalists convened the Hartford Convention in opposition to the war with Britain. Both the Virginia and Kentucky Resolutions, as well as the Hartford Convention, were symbolic and had no real effect on federal law. These early examples of nullification, however, did show the conviction of the people to hold the federal government in check. The Missouri Compromise was a deal between Northern and Southern states that admitted Missouri and Maine to the Union and preserved a balance of power in Congress. In 1819, the territory of Missouri applied for statehood in the United States. The admission of Missouri into the Union was poised to upset the balance of power in Congress between slave and free states. Settlers in Missouri had brought their slaves with them, and some 10,000 slaves lived alongside 50,000 whites. In addition, Missouri's state constitution, approved by its people, permitted slavery indefinitely into the future. Speaker of the House Henry Clay proposed a compromise to preserve a balance in Congress and satisfy both sides. His Missouri Compromise called for the admission of Missouri as a slave state while simultaneously admitting Maine as a free state. Admitting one slave state and one free state would maintain a balance of power in Congress. The plan also sought to settle the issue of slavery in the West for good by splitting the Louisiana Purchase in two along the 36-30 latitude line. North of the line, slavery would be illegal. South of the line, slavery would be legal. The tensions surrounding sectionalism intensified with the nullification crisis of 1832. In the 1820s, the federal government placed protective tariffs on foreign goods. A tariff is a tax on foreign imported goods that make them more expensive, thus making domestic goods more attractive to consumers. These tariffs were intended to protect domestic producers, who were mostly centered in urban areas in the north. However, southern states were outraged by the tariffs 
because they drove up the price of the manufactured goods that they purchased from abroad. Southerners believed it was unjust to drive up their cost of living just to protect northern industries. In 1828, when the federal government increased the tariffs on foreign goods, Vice President John C. Calhoun of South Carolina decried the new tariff as a tariff of abominations and argued that it was unjust and unconstitutional to the South. Citing the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions, Calhoun declared that the states had the authority to nullify the tariffs. In 1832, Calhoun returned to South Carolina and helped draft the Ordinance of Nullification, which declared that South Carolina and all states had the right to declare any and all tariffs as null and void. The nation was at a crossroads. Did states hold sovereignty over the federal government, or was the federal government supreme? Sectional differences and debates over slavery and nullification led the nation to openly address state sovereignty and federal supremacy. Supporters of the state's rights doctrine argue that as signers of the Constitution, the states are the source of federal power. As a result, they had the right to nullify laws that violate the Constitution, or even withdraw from the contract it has with the federal government and secede from the Union. On the Senate floor, Daniel Webster of Massachusetts vigorously defended the supremacy of the federal government. Webster argued that the Constitution was not merely a compact between states that can be interpreted freely. He declared that only the Supreme Court could interpret the Constitution, and that the Union was permanently inseparable. After intense debate, the nullification crisis was settled in 1833. Tariffs were gradually lowered, and South Carolina withdrew its ordinance of nullification. Sectional rivalries and the intense fight over slavery flamed up again when the Congress voted to annex the Republic of Texas in 1845. The annexation of Texas as a slave state tipped the balance of power in Congress and led to a war with Mexico. Months into the war, Representative David Wilmot of the Free State of Pennsylvania proposed the Wilmot Proviso. The proviso specified that slavery should be prohibited in any territories won in the war with Mexico. Southerners were outraged by Wilmot's proposal, and John C. Calhoun submitted a counterproposal to Congress. It declared that neither Congress nor any territorial government ought to have the right to prohibit slavery or regulate it in new Western territories in any way. Neither proposal passed Congress, but the bitter feud over slavery in new states and territories had been reignited. By 1848, the United States had won the territories of California and New Mexico from Mexico, and the stage was set for an epic battle over slavery. The question of slavery in California and New Mexico leads to fractures in American politics. In 1848, frustrated with both the Democrat and the Whig Party's lack of a strong stance against slavery, members of both parties break off and form the Free Soil Party. The party endorsed the Wilmot Proviso and adopted a platform that called for the prohibition of slavery in the West. The newly elected president, Zachary Taylor, pushed leaders in California and New Mexico to quickly apply for statehood. He believed that the people of each state would definitively decide the issue of slavery for themselves. Since California prohibited slavery, the admittance of California as a state would unbalance the power in Congress. The other territories run from Mexico would likely prohibit slavery too, which would make slave states greatly outnumbered in Congress. Anti-slavery forces in Congress wanted to abolish slavery in Washington, D.C., and Southerners adamantly wanted a new, stricter fugitive slave law across the country. By 1850, tensions were so high that Southerners were openly talking about having their states secede from the Union and leave the United States. To preserve the Union, Senator Henry Clay, known as the Great Compromiser, submitted a plan to settle the issue of slavery once and for all. Clay's plan known as the Compromise of 1850, included several provisions to satisfy both sides. First, California would enter the Union as a free state. Second, the people of New Mexico could use popular sovereignty or vote of the people to determine the issue of slavery in their territory without restrictions. Three, the slave trade would be outlawed in the District of Columbia, but slavery would still be permitted in the city. And four, the nation would adopt a stricter fugitive slave law that required states to return runaway slaves to their owners. Clay's proposals were generally supported by Northerners, but opposed by Southerners. In order to pass the compromise, 
Senator Stephen A. Douglas split the compromise into several proposals so that senators could vote freely without fear of supporting a measure unpopular in their state. Ultimately, the provisions of the compromise passed and the union was preserved for the time being. With the birth of the nation and into the 1800s, a growing sense of nationalism was bringing the United States together. But at the same time, regional and sectional differences threatened to split the country apart. 